Hello again, everybody. My name is John D. Healy. My podcast is called It's Good to Talk. And it's also good to listen. Today we'll be doing listening and talking. People know me because I got this book out a couple of years ago from my friend Tony McGurn. And that's how it all started. His life starts 1941 up to a few years ago. Liffey Movers, van company, moving all overseas and local in New York. They've been around longer than Jeopardy. So when it comes to moving, let Liffey do the lifting. I always have a guest on. And my guest again today has been back before. Last week we were on and we were trying to negotiate a united Ireland. And we made progress. So <laughs> because we were celebrating 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement, but we went back to the history of the Easter Rising. So my listeners, check out that podcast and check out Jerry Coyle was on as well and another one about his dad, Henry Coyle. That's all history. Today, we're going to talk about Irish ports and Irish ports. Ireland is blessed with the amount of Irish ports we have. Brian Layden, you're back with me again today and welcome back, Brian. Thank you, John. I'm in more familiar territory now um, as a, a full-time writer myself. Uh, I love the history and you have to know what's going on. Um, but I'm very comfortable in the whole domain with the literature and the poetry. And of lately, recent years, I set up a small uh, indie imprint to publish poetry, uh, contemporary poetry, but also some historic as well. So um, it's a very interesting but very broad topic, John. So we'll see where we go with this today. All right. Well, you can start in Mayo, Sligo. Uh, you have Rafferty is from Mayo, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I, I, Raff, when you mentioned that we'd be talking about poetry, John, and as a publisher of poetry, Lepus Print, uh, Rafferty seemed a good fit because he has a very famous line uh, where he says, here I am again with my back to the wall singing to empty pockets. And that generally is the fate of the poet. Uh, yeah. It's not the most lucrative of businesses. And yet we seem to produce a huge amount of poems and poetry in Ireland. And uh, I would think, you know, when we talk about poetry, there's very few people didn't have some kind of line in school that they learned. Maybe it's the Irish where we started with Rafter, you know, an ish top. Chucked an Ari by and law, I call on Sheen, who is Thresh Nafela Breed, or Doi Mae You know, th th there's, there's lines that are buried in your mind, probably from your school mm. days, you know. Um, I think of maybe not too many people mm. would remember, maybe, but the line is buried in their head. You know, the ballad of Father Gilligan, that's a Yeats poem where he says, okay. the old priest Peter Gilligan was weary night and day for half his flock were in their beds or under the green sod lay. Mm -hmm. That was a very learned by rote poetry in school. And mm -hmm. I doubt if you have maybe an uncle somewhere at a wedding or a oh. funeral or some event wouldn't start, you know, uh, I, he said, I, a bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute saloon. Everybody has this lines of poetry buried I, in their heads. Be, I could be the Irish drunken uncle indeed. Going back <laughs> to Raffrey, yeah. going back to Raffrey there, like yeah. when you say Miss and Chuck Denari, Tawn Law, Basic, you know, the I, for the English listeners, I don't think they ever get the beauty and romantic style of Irish poetry. Mm. Like that's describing like spring is coming again. I'm going to raise my sails. It's signifying hope and optimism. Yes. Well, let's move on to your part of the world. Uh, W.B. Yeats. Uh, yes, I'm living in a beautiful part of the world, Sligo. And Sligo would be known as Yeats country. Uh, Yeats, the family had big connections here with Sligo. And really, very few poets have maybe Wordsworth and, you know, for the Lake District and maybe... Um, there's a couple of other poets, but there's very few poets that would would be so deeply and thoroughly associated with a particular landscape. And right. under Bear Ben Bulban, Nocknare Mountain, the Lake Isle of Inish Free, he made a particular thing of this terrain territory. And he, mm. he was very interested <clears throat> in finding an identity for Irish poets, 
as you say, they came out mm. of the Irish language. The Irish language have been, got dissipated and literally the death of the Irish language happened around famine times when there was a Gaelic speaking society, yeah. especially in the West of Ireland. Yeah. So you had this political <laughs> movement in Ireland, pre-revolutionary, but, you know, the Gaelic leagues and also they were trying to revive the culture through reviving the language. Mm. Yeats brought an extra dimension to that because he said there's, there's tremendous myths and stories, heroic mm. tales and sagas of Ireland and they are very unique to Ireland and by incorporating those along with the landscape and placing them here in the Sligo landscape, okay. he began to create I, a whole identity for Ireland. Yeah, I'll make a comment there, your own county, County Sligo, mm. the mountain Bill Bourbon, at the bottom of I've never climbed it. It's mm -hmm. beyond me now, perhaps. But uh, there was a plaque at the bottom of the mountain. Do you remember what was on the plaque? Uh, well, it, Yates himself is buried at the foot of Ben Bulban, and he has a very okay, famous good. thing on his headstone, right. which is "Cast a cold eye on life, on death, horseman pass by." That was written. Yates died in France in 1939, and interestingly, you see the the body. The outbreak of war, Second World War, coincided with that. So they couldn't get his body home. It would be several years before he was reinterred. He was interred in France briefly, knowing he'd be moved back. But his intention always was to be buried at Drumcliff in Sligo. And he yeah. had, even dying in France, he wrote Under Ben Bulban, was one of his right. last, and a great poem. Yeah. So it was very much in his mind that he would close the circle of the Yates family. Mm -hmm. and and the Pollocksons and Middletons, his mother's people, all associated with Sligo, coming back and fulfilling yeah. that circle. That's exactly the, the plaque I was referring to. Mm -hmm. And so many people, when they go to Ben Bourbon, they always remember and they always, like, quote the plaque again, cast a cold eye on life and death. Yes, and and uh, Yeats's use of uh, not only heroic sagas but fairy tales. It is probably there was a poll done, and one of the most popular and most beloved of all poems uh, is Yeats's uh, "The Stolen Child." Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, from a world more full of weeping than you can understand. Mm. And that is mm. full of the landscapes of. Sligo, so whether it's you know uh, where the wave of moonlight glosses the dim grey sands with light far off by furthest mm. rosses, we foot it all the night, mm. or in uh, in the hills above Glencar, where the wandering water gushes from the hills above Glencar. So his imagination and landscape, they're a beautiful fit, and maybe yeah. that's a big part of when people are enjoying poetry and that that they see the landscape of fresh. They mm. see how an imagination can take an ordinary uh, mm. lake and place and immortalise it and make it something yeah. very meaningful forever. That maybe is mm. one of the, the great gifts of the Irish poet. I think it is, yeah. And I move on to another guy I kind of have a love-hate relationship with, and that's Patrick Kavanagh. Mm -hmm. Patrick Kavanagh from yeah. Monaghan. And when he writes about the landscape, yes. it's the opposite, I think, to Yeats, because he's talking about picking potatoes in the rain and... Yeah. It's dreary and it's stony and it's boggy. And when I had Jerry Coyle on here, we didn't talk much about that, but Jerry did refer to the abject poverty back in the day. And I, yeah. Jerry did mention about potato picking in Scotland. And Jerry, like That's myself, right. I think the only place that Jerry and myself likes to pick potatoes off is the dinner table. But Kavanaugh, <laughs> Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh had a lot of those, like, kind of sad, dreary ones. But in fairness, yeah. he had the one hit wonder then with Raglan Road. Raglan and that's the that's a verse or poetry he wrote when his girlfriend dumped him. And if you got a, a glimpse of the personality of Kavanaugh, you mightn't blame her for dumping him on Raglan Road. <laughs> but he was smart enough, no more than myself, he couldn't sing, he could write. And he gave this song, a verse to be sung by Luke Kelly. Yes. And Luke Kelly turned that into a famous song on Raglan Road and Easter Morn. I would recommend my listeners to Google that and get the version of Luke Kelly singing that. So Kavanaugh, in that regard, turned that mishap or, you know, it's not nice to get dumped by your partner, no. but you got a picture on Raglan of Road. Yeah, on Raglan to turn Road. it into beauty. And to turn it into um, beauty. Yes. Yeah. 
he he and she would go on to to marry and but still remain friendly with Kavanaugh. She understood that God no, not a good match. But uh, on Raglan Road on an autumn day, I saw her first and knew that her yeah. dark hair would weave a snare that I might one day rue. I saw the danger, yet I walked along the enchanted way. And I said, let grief be a falling leaf at the dawn of the day. So it's a beautiful, beautiful meditation on kind of, look, I saw the danger, yet I walked. That's love. You have to, you have to plunge and you have to feel the danger. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, the thing about Cavan is you're right. It comes from terrible poverty. It's a very small, impoverished farm in Monaghan, the stony grey soil of Monaghan. And he decides that he is just, I mean, he has a very busy, active mind. He is a, he is a born poet, wherever it comes from. Uh, there's a great story told about Kavanagh that, in fact, you know, he was a better poet than a footballer. He was putting goal for the local football team and he heard the ice cream seller call and, and he left the goals. <laughs> to the ice cream. The other side got a call. So that, uh, but like those memorable lines we talk about, um, you know, the axle roll of a rut lock cart burnt the broken stick of meaning too and this is about spraying the potatoes i mean his early poetry is all about the poetry of place it's like in yates and all of that but there's there ah. will come in him a visionary side Quite. he will he will uh help Seamus Heaney, and we'll come to Seamus Heaney later but he talks about this in Kavanagh. it begins he says talking about uh a heavenly place and it ends up a kind of placeless heaven um, when he talks about, you know, uh, the Canal Bank walk poems in Dublin. When oh, he's a, yeah. he, he leaves Monaghan, he leaves these poems, but but writes memorably of the time. And I suppose of any exile or immigrant, you think more fondly mm. of the place when you're away from it than you did when you were there. Um, mm. So yeah, he, he has this, I mean in memory of my mother, which describes that world. I do not think of you lying in the wet clay of a Monaghan graveyard. I see you walking down a lane amongst the poplars on your way to the station or happily going to second mass on a summer Sunday. You you meet me and you say, don't forget to see about the cattle. Amongst your earliest words, the angels stray. Mm. And there's already a hankering for something kind of more poetic and the right. most looking after the cattle. Mm. So Kavanagh, um, very perhaps overlooked poet. He was misfortunate in the sense that some of his publications would coincide with wars going on. He right. he was in Dublin. He was an uncouth, rough man in a right. lot of ways in his personality. Oh, but some of that was he was treated very badly and looked down upon. And um he was seen as a bit of a, you know, a culty. Uh, Brendan Behan was famously remarked um, that, you know, there was a barrel boy going down Grafton Street with a barrel load of dung and Behan looks on and says, I see Kavanaugh's moving house, you know. Yeah. So there was awful snide thought you know, remark on this. Well, we will move on to, speaking of Brendan Behan, I guess we can't leave Brendan Behan out. Like, what's his one again, the old triangle with Jingle Jangle. Yes, and yeah. that one that that came from his play, uh, I think called Queer Fellow, or the Boxer Boy, yeah, the Boxer Boy. Boy, yeah, yeah. I saw so, Newport Bean do a one man act of that, mm-hmm. and it was excellent to say the least. Uh, Bean, Bean, well, many of them, I guess, back in the day, but one of, was one of the first uh, Irish poets to come out as being bisexual, mm-hmm. and bisexuality was kind of a new thing then. Because people thought, well, you're either one or the other. And he was in a pub in Dublin one time and he was being interviewed by an American journalist. And they got whiff of the fact that this bisexuality thing. And he said to Brendan Behan, is it true, Brendan Behan, that you are a bisexual? And Brendan Behan said, I put it this way, he said. Eleanor Roosevelt, he said, who was known to be the ugliest woman on the planet. And... He looked at one of the waiters. The waiters then used to wear like an, an apron that looked like a skirt. And Bean says to the American journalist, if I had a choice to sleep with Eleanor Roosevelt or that waiter, I think I would choose the waiter. The waiter. So I'd, yeah. you know, uh, but I'd recommend to people, um, it's, it's a classic old 
book now called Dead as Doornails, written by Anthony Cronin. And it's an account of Dublin at that time with Behan and Kavanagh, you know, and the right. kind of rivalry that went on there. And um, there was, uh, there's a great account of uh, sort of Behan making a kind of a lunge at Kavanagh, who uses his coat like, uh, or at uh, Cronin. He makes right. a lunge at Cronin because Cronin's kind of seen as very respectable and, and uh, an academic uh, right. Law. He's 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 not quite of that stripe as Brendan's working class Dublin credentials. So mm. Brendan Bean makes a lunge. Brendan, and, Brendan so, drank a lot. Yeah, he did. He mm. did, and he was oh. diabetic. And there's some talk that maybe it didn't suit him because he should. You know, if he got very drunk and out of control, sometimes perhaps the insulin issue was a thing there. Sure. But anyway, he made a lunge at Cronin. Cronin used his coat like a bull door, like a, a bullfighter. Yeah. Matador's cape no. and uh, Behan sort of stumbled and went and Kavanagh remarked, I told you he says the bacon would be no match for the slicer so he said <laughs> uh, it a description of the, like the nimbleness of Cronin very, versus very the kind of yeah. heavy yeah. setness of Behan uh, yeah. very influential and today he'd have been used in social media I think hugely because oh, when Behan had a play on in London and the house numbers, you know, the audiences were slipping a bit, he'd show up seemingly drunk and make a scene or cause a thing and word to get out oh god did you see being yeah. again or did you hear yeah, what he yeah. said so he was very very good at using his uh his yeah. kind of personality as a way to Personal, sell the work yeah i guess the same and go for my friend from the pogues uh shane yeah shane shane mcgowan like when he's here in new york at a gig the big thing is everyone wants to know how drunk he was mm-hmm. or how yeah. crazy or how yeah. funny or the case may yeah. be so it seems to draw attention, but it does, uh, and sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a bad way. You have in New York, of course, the Chelsea Hotel, and there's the famous one that had twenty ah. whiskey straight whiskeys that Dylan Thomas and right. died uh, in the White Horse Inn Tavern Inn, and he had been staying in the Chelsea Hotel, and he died then. The official verdict on, which was interesting for a poet, the cause of death was insult to the brain. Um, right. So uh, there is this thing of the drink being associated. The Simpsons have a great actually gag in it, whereas the, an entire section of the parade in The Simpsons in Springfield is the drunken Irish poet section. It can mm. be a bit of a cliche and a bit of a tiresome cliche in mm. a sense, but those were very hard times. The likes of Behan, Kavanagh, all of those. Sometimes the only way to alleviate the sting of poverty and humiliation was the alcohol, but it sometimes took away from the the, the, the stature of the talent and the mm. and the beauty of the work. You know, so uh, it's nice to have it corrected in some ways by people knowing the work rather than the personality. You know, that's true. Yeah, or maybe a blend of both. As I always yes. say to my friends, Guinness is conducive to good conversation. So let's move on a little bit again. You yes. mentioned earlier somewhere else that we didn't have too many women no. uh, poets in Ireland. Yes. There seemed to be a shortage of them. I'm sure they were there somewhere, but maybe they didn't get recognition. Can you expand on that, please? Yes, um, you know, there are a lot of posters of the great Irish writers, and you'll see Flann O'Brien, O'Casey, Joyce, Yeats, Shaw, and the you know, the, the women don't seem to feature all that much. Uh, we have to say that the society was kind of balanced against them when we're talking about the 1916 rising, how active a part so many of those women did have in that. And yet afterwards, they were kind of shunted to the sideline of history again. Mm-hmm. There was work in bands when women couldn't pursue teaching. They had to quit if they got married or were having mm-hmm. children. So there was a right. lot of stuff went on that kept I, I, the women kind of out of the picture, out of history. Right. Today, thankfully, uh, we have very, very strong women poets. Um, I have a very personal interest in something. This was a book that Leapus Print published um, of Leland Bardwell at 100. She would have been 100 uh, in 2022. She would, uh, Patrick Kavanagh met his wife to be in Leland's flat. Um, She knew Luke Kelly used to sleep on her sofa and... um, borrow books from her she had a kind of a little salon in Leeson Street where a lot of poets came and found that this woman who was a Protestant stock from Luke Slip you know but the poor Protestant as I say with the water running down the inside of the walls with the leaky roof in the big house right. um, 
but she was a galvanizing figure for a lot of young poets who 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 came to her the likes who would make his name like Paul Durkin and that came along to her so we were bringing her back into history and this book has uh, you know uh, a huge selection of Leland's poetry What's all the name of the book by right? women poets and women I'll poets. read you one lovely poem Thank which you. kind of say poems of Leland's which um it was a favourite to Leland to recite and do as well. But it says, I think, a little bit about the fate as well. It's called A Single Rose. And it says, I have willed my body to the furthering of science, although I'll not be there to chronicle my the findings. I can imagine all the students pouring over me. My God, is that a liver? And those brown cauliflowers are lungs? Yes, sir, a fine example of how not to live. And what about the brain? Alas, the brain. I doubt if this poor sample ever had one. And with his forceps, he extracts a single rose. It's a lovely poem. It and is. It's, it's a correction for her saying, yeah, alas, did they have a brain at all? Well, she's well, answering with beauty right. and all of that. Excellent. So we, we, we would have I'm a lovely... Where do, I get the book? Where do I get the book, Brian? Uh, you can probably best best bet is really online. Go to www.leapisprint.com. Okay. We have a website there. In fact, that was book what they call an occasional book of poems to mark the hundredth anniversary of her birth. It's practically sold out. I have some, but it's it it sold right. well over the year twenty twenty two, which says there is a, a healthy appetite and belief in poetry still. Oh, I is, see. yeah. Yeah. So you would have other women poets, Elaine Nequillen on, who's a great friend and supporter of our imprint. And mm -hmm. uh, she uh, would have been a friend of Leland's and also know some of that kind of uh, kind of a stepping stone to the modern poetry right. of the likes of Mary O'Malley and Rita Ann Higgins and the great Paula Meehan. Um, Paula, what? fabulous poet, uh, written very movingly about issues that affect women there's one very strong poem the statue of the virgin at granard speaks which is the Anne Lovett case and uh, she says in her poem of that title on a night like this i remember the child who came with 15 summers to her name and she lay down alone at my feet without midwife or doctor or friend to hold her hand and she pushed her secret out into the night Far mm. from the town, tucked up in little scandals, bargains struck, words broken, prayers, promises. And though she cried out to me in extremis, I did not move. I didn't lift a finger to help her. I didn't intercede with heaven, nor whisper the charmed word in God's ear. On a night like this, I number the days of the silence and turn of the back to the light. O oh, sun, centre of our foolish dance, burning heart of stone, mother to us all, hear me and have pity. Very, oh, so you have very, oh, very strong poetry coming out of this absolutely. section. Thin scale of this scale, rush scale indeed. Yes. Very sad story. A tough story. Um, obviously, we're talking poetry here and uh, you cannot, I suppose, deal with Irish poetry without addressing Seamus Heaney. Yeah. Um, Seamus Heaney, it's the 10th anniversary of his death this year in, in mm. 2023. He died on the 31st of August uh, 2013. Interestingly, Heaney was born in January 19, or in April 1939, and W.B. Yeats died in January 1939. Oh. So Heaney was born the same year that Yeats died. Mm -hmm. The mantle of that kind of greatness of getting out from under the shadow, mm -hmm. which Patrick Kavanagh struggled against in a way, to get out from under the influence and shadow of Yeats, yeah. it is very most successfully done by Heaney, who takes a great deal more from... Kavanagh in a lot of ways to get right. started to begin his career and will yeah. use that agricultural background of his like yeah, Kavanagh did yeah. with, with, with digging uh, right. the famous poem her I, I can't dig turf like the great men of the past I right. dig with my pen you know like the pen yeah well it's often yeah. said the pen is stronger than the sword yes my podcast today is called it's good to talk my guest was Brian Layden and today we're talking about famous Irish poets and various poets and all yeah. that. So, 
let's go to Joyce because we're coming up to Bloomsday and mm -hmm. let's Joyce be famous for Ulysses of course I'll give the quotation later on sure uh, yeah J James Joyce uh, there's an interesting thing here because it, it um, he's best known of course for Ulysses and uh, he it's an extraordinary work a, a love poem in ways to Dublin. It, the use of the language is very poetic, very lyrical in places. He employs all kinds of things. He was a poet as well himself, you know, poems penny each and other things. Probably, uh, you know, not as versatile a uh, poet as he was a prose. Mm. But there is this thing where, you know, again, mentioned Dylan Thomas, he said, I write sometimes there's sort of uh, prose with blood pressure. It's right. kind of lyrical. It's, it's right. It, it has ambitions that the language itself is as big a part. The word choice is as important as what you're saying. Correct. So uh, mm. a lot of us writers would read mm. poetry, and Joyce did as well, to keep the language fresh, to yeah. stop the language of commerce and business mm. every day mm. and, and kind of revive it. And, and and stop falling into the traps that language can weave for you, which is to think, you know, if you use unoriginal language, you think unoriginally. So um, this is the, the idea that poetry would keep us on our toes, which I right. think it does. And Joyce was brilliant at that. And that legacy is huge. I, I think one of the most lyrical passages, it's written as prose, but it's poetry, his masterful short story, The Dead. And that is set on Usher's Island on Little Christmas, mm -hmm. the Feast of the Epiphany. And the snow is falling on all the little headstones and graveyards and the mutinous yeah. waves and the gate crosses of shell. Back, and that back. last paragraph, it rises to a crescendo that's equal to any mm -hmm. of the poetry that any of the famous poets have written, you know. So yeah. um, we were there is not, no, yeah. You were missing me not to mention uh, Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. uh, was he more known for writing prose and plays or poetry? And well, when... I think Wilde had a tremendous talent because his prose is superb and his prose influenced the likes of Yeats and many more uh, for a kind of a, a lovely kind of heightened elegance to this prose. And his plays are still performed and still some of the most popular plays uh, no matter how often they're staged, they've entered right. our kind of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he he, he ah. comes very undone. He's fated, celebrated, but we mentioned the homosexuality uh, earlier in the context of mm -hmm. Brendan Behan. Uh, for for Oscar Wilde, um, you know, taking a court case at a time when uh, homosexuality was an imprisonable offence, you know, um, it's almost like he had a self-destructive impulse. His friends said he should flee to France. He didn't. He fought the court case. Mm -hmm. He was arrested and in jail. He famously said, well, if this is the way Queen Victoria treats her prisoners, she doesn't deserve to have any. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, he suffered imprisonment. And he wrote the ballad of Reading Jail, you know. I mm -hmm. never saw a man look so wistful upon the day. Or that little tint of blue that prisoners call the sky. It's resonant with these mm -hmm. tremendous lines. So mm -hmm. you have to say his poetry is... Uh, is of equal. He's an all rounder. He's a, he's right. a in that sense. Yeah. Interesting. When I had Jerry Coyle on here too, and I read Jerry's book about his father Henry Coyle, mm -hmm. and Henry Coyle, uh, gun runner, etc., and all that. But when he was in prison many times, he actually wrote some beautiful uh, poetry, and some of them are put to the air of various songs and that. Yes. So again, as I said on the previous podcast with you, sometimes out of adversity. You know, comes greatness, you know. So we're moving along. Let's go to your guy, Shane Messini. Oh, yeah. Shane Messini. And my quotation then at the end is, what is better to sit at the end of the day and drink wine with friends or even substitutes for friends? Mm -hmm. I kind of like that. Yeah. But let's go on to Heaney. Heaney. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Seamus Heaney. I've, I've met the man. I introduced him. Uh, at an event in Manor Hamilton in County Leitrim 
And, uh, you know, he shook my hands afterwards, having listened to me attentively. Here was a man who had, I suppose, everybody hanging on his coattails, the, the, the demands on his time, the pressures of his talent. But mm. he said he, he went gratefully wherever he went, Seamus Heaney. Mm. Um, I love Heaney for his poetry. Right. I also think he's one of the great writers, essays on mm. poetry, on his fellow poets. Right. He always He's like a headmaster who, who finds a good word to say about the worst scoundrel in a row. Right. You know? um, he's very, very perceptive, but also very generous. And right. as I say, big fan of Yeats, a big fan of Kavanagh, mm. and managed to steer his own course. Right. I would sometimes, uh, you know, he, he he has this beautiful poem, you know, I'll sometime make the time to drive out west into mm. County Clare along right. the flaggy shore in September or October. Right. The wind and the light are working off each other. Mm -hmm. uh, he has, uh, pe people say, oh, well, we don't quote him as much as we do the likes of Kavanagh and Yeats, but he is a very quotable poet. Right. Um, I think he had the whole... We we had our program, John, on on the Good Friday Agreement and right. that, and, and Seamus Heaney had to negotiate um, a very thin, narrow, tight walk to raise his own voice. People were dying. There was terrible violence. There was explosions. And is it fair to recite poetry, to write poetry? in when people are suffering so much and he made the case which is very relevant always to why we should be interested in poetry he says that you know just because there's pain and darkness in the world does not mean to say that we should not raise our voice and if how we speak is equal mm. to the events to the pain it won't change things it won't stop violence it won't bring peace to the world but the experiences people are having, if we can articulate them in a way that seems equal, in the words are equal to what... Well, I, 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 totally, I totally endorse that uh, statement expression because it's good to talk, it's important to communicate. There are so many languages in the world and yet people can't communicate. So it's important that we, even if it's in times of darkness or sorrow, it's important to express and if it's expressing feelings or emotions or just a simple that you love somebody, it's yeah. important to get the message out. You're generous with your time, Brian. And that's good that we talk and share the poetry of the past. Because if someone needs to keep yeah. the story going. So, yes. Shin Scale, let's move on to, oh, you did mention Shimasini's museum is in Belfast, right? Yeah? Uh, well, there's the Heaney home place in Balahi where Seamus Heaney is buried, you know, and his his epitaph is a, a walk on air against your better judgment, which is a lovely saying, like you know, just just transcend, uplift. Um, I had a very memorable day at the Seamus Heaney funeral, mm. uh, you know, in 2013, where, you know, the... The great, the good, but also the whole of Ireland turned out just mm. to honour this man who had touched their lives in so many ways and had been so generous in so many ways mm. to well, everyone. Well, he did achieve another piece. And he place is a lovely day's uh, outing. Um, but uh, failing that, I recommend as well, there's the Heaney um, Home Place exhibition in uh what used to be the, the old parliament, the Bank of Ireland, opposite Trinity College, there's a great Heaney exhibition okay, there, good. if you can only make it to Dublin. But if you can make it to Balahi, it's beautiful. One thing I'll say is of interest there as well. Uh, we talked about Yeats at, right at the start, about the landscape and dramatic Ben Bulban and all that. Heaney's country, Balahi, Tomb Bridge, Mahara Felt and that, it's the most ordinary, you know, good, as James Joyce would have said, you know, Good bullock fattening pastures is right. what's there. Nothing right. too spectacular. And right. yet all this tremendous poetry comes out of this remembering that landscape mm -hmm. and the ways of being there. And I note that Joyce uh, was buried in Zurich. Uh, I'm not sure if... Trieste, okay. yes. Okay, yeah. correct. Thank you very much. So finally, I'm going to move on to one of my favourites, actually. Um, and then we'll probably wrap it up. <clears throat> Michael D. Higgins is the president of Ireland, who was my professor when I was in college in Galway. Mm. And I'm not sure what subject he was supposed to be teaching myself and, and 
by fellow students in the class. But he loved his poetry so much that the class consisted of him uh, reciting his own poetry yeah. on a daily basis. Well, every day we had him for, for class. I think he was supposed to teach the social studies. And one day in the class, his poetry was so like mellow. Mm -hmm. I, I fell asleep in the class. And my fellow students were hitting me on the back. Just, I was snoring. But Michael D continued on. He, I think it was like a compliment to him. Mm -hmm. It's like when you're at a dinner in someone's house and you belch or pass gas. It you means rest. Food. The food is good, yeah. The food is good. And but, do you remember his poems? Or would you, would I do, yeah. I, I, but one in particular, I do. I have two, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I, one I think is beautiful. Um, he talks, he has one called The Storyteller which is about, say, somebody like yourself or another poet who was some poet who was a friend of his. Yeah. So he describes that situation extremely well. And another one he has, um, it's kind of a sad, happy poem. It'll come to me in a minute, perhaps. And it's about his father dying. And he describes it in, in, in graphically. Mm -hmm. And that's called, I think, The Betrayal. Yes, and in that poem, he mentions mentions how his father broke somebody's spectacles in the hospital, and at that time, we're back to De Valera again. The yes. guy's from New York here, yeah. Or as Tony King said, he's from uh, Brooklyn. I really couldn't care less where he's from. I know he's buried somewhere in Dublin, and De Valera cut the subsidies on the medical support so people couldn't afford glasses, okay? And I'll leave Michael D. Higgins there, and I want to go back and mention James Joyce again, because mm. my next stop is Finnegan's Wake. Oh, That's nice. a famous a famous bar here in New York City on 73rd and 1st Avenue, and owned by Tony King, who's a, a writer, a poet, and a genius in his own right, and he keeps an eye on my podcast. Oh. When Tony King had the bar for 50 years and then he sold it over to Finola Lynch yeah. and she's in good good hands there too. It was a nice fit there, John, because in some ways, you know, if James Joyce, where does the poetry come from, you know, and all that, James Joyce wrote Ulysses, it would be very much seen as, uh, you know, a brain, a, a book from the brain, from the sun, of the rational mind of the bright daylight, whereas Finnegan's Wake, the book, <clears throat> Uh, that a lot of people find very hard going, which it is because Joyce breaks into and creates an entirely new language, really, to tell the story. And but part of the reason for that is often thought that if if Finnegan's <coughs> Wake is a day in Dublin, then or if Ulysses is a day in Dublin, then Finnegan's Wake is nighttime, the dream, you know, the dream <coughs> of River Liffey and the Liffey goddess, mm -hmm. and um, it's the unconscious mind and. Mm -hmm all the games and craziness that kind of uh, resolve themselves into messages and signals. I'm, and I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, yeah. Brian, because yeah. like the Finnegan's Wake here in 73rd and 1st in 2023 mm -hmm. absolutely re resembles the remarks you just made <laughs> with the conversations people have and how they chat to each other and how they miscommunicate a lot of times mm -hmm. and they don't get the clear, the clear message of what they're saying or how they're saying it, or even if they care, because they're enjoying themselves. Yes. And that's what Finnegan's Wake is about. You don't have to judge other people. You can just go in and be yourself and relax at the end of the day, as he quoted there. And if you don't have friends, you can always substitute friends and still enjoy the drink. Yeah. Brian, have Morris. you to add again before we finish? Well, no, I'll let you off now because James Joyce said with Anne Olivia Plurabella to that Plurabella place uh, of Finnegan's Wake where uh, Joyce also called the pubs, he said, a hydrocomic establishment. I like so, that. <laughs> I like that. Too. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure always. Uh, always. To have